sorry for the tardy. I apologize. Uh, we have a special guest this morning, uh, the president of our St. Louis Seminary, um, is is here and he's preaching at both services and he's um, uh, leading Bible class right now uh, in the fellowship hall and he's an Old Testament guy so he's talking about Psalm 1 that's that's his bag is the uh, the Old Testament he, he's a nice young man um, I'm starting to feel that everyone else is younger than me somehow or other you know uh, but he looks like he's about 12 Am I right about that, Lance? Yeah. Yeah, right. You look at him and there's no way, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, he's doing a great job at Concordia Seminary, which is one of our two seminaries. That's in St. Louis. We have one in Fort Wayne. And my guess is, I, 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 don't, I should have asked him, but it may still be the largest Lutheran seminary in the world. Um, even though you know it's declined since its peak of of probably the early 70s, where we probably had about 800 students at the place. That would have included graduate students and MDivs and everybody. Uh, now the number is probably something around 400, including graduate students, vicars, and so on. Um, but again, everybody has declined in their enrollment, and many seminaries are closing straight up or merging with other seminaries, even seminaries from other church bodies. Um, the only seminaries that can kind of stay open on their own are those that have a large enough endowment. Concordia Seminary has a large enough endowment. They still have financial challenges, of course. And, of course, Concordia Fort Wayne also has a significant endowment and, and it is also able to stay open and support education. So, um, anyway, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you uh, took on flesh of the Virgin Mary, that you might return our flesh to us pristine and cleansed, holy in your sight. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us to make use of our lives, body and soul, flesh and blood, unto your uh, glory and unto the benefit of our neighbor, so that your cross might be uh, shining before us at all times and true glory be given to you. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to finish up the second article of the Creed, The Person and Work of Christ. Um, we, I believe, left off uh, last week just by saying Christ has clothed us in his perfect righteousness. Um, and you have this, again, terribly shocking word of God from St. Paul where uh, Christ becomes sin. Doesn't just become, doesn't just bear sin, be, but becomes it. So if you have any doubt about where your sin has gone, look at Christ. That's where your sin has gone. It's not yours. You can't keep it. You can't have it. Because Christ took it away. Right. So we live in that freedom. Um, and then the flip side to that is while he becomes the sinner, we become the righteous. So he acquits us and declares us to be righteous in his sight. Um, it doesn't get any better than that. Because it's so certain. It's not dependent on us, thank God. What a mess we make of things, but he will take care of us. All right, let me pause there. Questions about that Second Corinthians text, which again we did look at a little bit last week. All right. No, no, the law still applies, buddy. Um, yep, it sure does. But so... For Lutherans, the way you keep it straight is to say what is of the law and what pertains to the law, what is of the gospel and pertains to the gospel. So when you're talking about your status in the sight of God, you're talking gospel, forgiveness, mercy, peace, joy, all those blessings from Christ earned by him, by his death on the cross. And the law simply has no place there. None. It doesn't 
in that sense, it does not apply where the gospel is. Right? That's what forgiveness is. All right? Uh, when we're talking about life, and especially life in this world, life in relation to neighbor, guess what? The law still applies. Not going to make you right in the sight of God. I mean, this is, where, this is where all faulty Christianity runs off the rails, that it applies the law to our status in God's sight for salvation. Right? So you have, to, you have to keep those, you know, what are we talking about? Are we talking about life in the world, our own inherent righteousness, that's always according to the law, or are we talking about our righteousness in the sight of God, that is always inherent in Christ, and for that reason is certain because it's gifted to us according to his righteousness. Okay? Ready to move on? All right. Move on. Oh, come on. Uh, there's something messed up about this thing. Let me see if I can try that. Oh, better. Okay. So, now. Voila. Okay. So here we have, and I've talked about it already, so we don't need to spend too much time on it, but the parable of the banquet, the wedding banquet. Remember, the king says, you know, bring in the people from the highways and byways, and then what happens? When the people all come in, who does he see? Right. There's a man there unclothed, right? Uh, not naked, but just clothed in his everyday clothes. And... The king boots him out. And this seems unfair, right? I mean, why would you expect Joe Plummer to show up in his tuxedo on a work day? You wouldn't. So what's happening here? Again, there's a cultural detail that everybody who heard the parable knew, but that we don't. And it's very simple. It is that the king has given a suit of clothing to every person who walks into the banquet hall. And what had to have happened was the plumber says, ah, if the king doesn't like me the way I am, he can stuff it. And the king's very unenthusiastic about that treatment of his graciousness, right? Because what does it do? It covers up the filth of the party goer. And you have a number of parables where you have, for example, the parable of the lost son, when he comes back, what does his father do? Gives him a turban, gives him new clothes, gives him sandals, and gives him the checkbook. That's what the ring is. It is the checkbook. Um, and it's an amazing thing, given the fact that according to the law, the father owes the son a big nothing. And of course, the son wants to play Let's Make a Deal, right? If I could only be a servant in your household again, I, you know, that's all I deserve. And the father goes, you're my son. What are you talking? Serve? You're crazy. That's not the way it goes. You're my own child. You smell like the hogs. Now, what does a Jew think about a son who smells like the hogs? Yeah. I mean, if it were me, and it's not, thankfully, I'd be ordering up a bath for the boy. But he doesn't. He says, cover him up. He still stinks like the hogs, but he's my son. I love him. He's embraced him. He's run out to greet him. I, I, you know, again, he's had to hike up his skirts to do this and suffer mockery. This is God. This is our Father. Right? So, again, these parables are so deadly clear about God's grace and his willingness to take us as sinners and resolve that by covering our filth with a robe made clean by the blood of Christ. That's the deal. It's the best deal in the whole world, right? Because you hand over death, sin, hell, filth, depravity, all that great stuff, right? And he hands over righteousness, holiness, blessedness, perfect relationship with the Father, and you get to trade. When I was a seminary student, this is funny. So seminary students are always selling books back and forth. And I remember standing in the hall of my dorm watching two guys negotiate about the price of a book. 
you'll have some idea how long ago this was when I tell you what they're haggling over. So the seller says, I want $10. The buyer says, it's worth 12 let me give you 12 And I had to step in between them and say, you boys don't understand capitalism, right? <laughs> right? Pastors, they know nothing. But my point about this is, in the game of let's make a deal, the Father is granting us unaccountable riches, and we are handing over flabbergasting poverty in exchange. And he's willing to make that deal. He's also a lousy capitalist. You know, you always want something for... It's a quid pro quo, but in our case, the quid is really bad, and the, the quo is fabulous. Okay? Let me pause there. Well, from before the fall, right? He knows what's going to happen. Remember we talked about um, video games that have the reset button? Right? There's a reset button on the world, folks. God could have used it. And it's all gone. Let's start again. And how often do... Hmm? Well, not entirely, because he still saved Noah and his family, eight souls and all. So, so he doesn't want to... He, he threatened to destroy Israel till Moses came along and said, I tell you what, take me instead. Right? I'll, I'll die for them. They deserve it. I get it. But, you know, and of course he has other arguments too. So there are cases like that. But before the world is created, he knows what's going to happen. He doesn't cause it. Knowing and causing are two different things. Um, and yet he still plans from eternity to offer his own dearest treasure in substitution for people who have in no way, shape, or form deserved it. And Jesus even dies for those who will hate him, persecute him, and murder him, as we continue to do today, of course. right? Um, and yet he still loves even those. Yeah. So it, the answer is really, really, really simple. Love. Not love that's earned. Love that is given. Right? Our sickness, and this is because of the fall, we think our love has to be earned. We're all Ann Rand at heart. Those of you who know her work. I mean, it's great stuff, of course, but totally pagan. Um, she thinks the only worthy love is the love that is earned. She's a capitalist in that sense. Uh, God says the only worthy love is the love that is given. So what in us causes God to love us? Er, well, nothing. And it's good because if he's starting to look at us and say, ooh, are you worthy? What's the outcome going to be? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, wait till that lightning comes. Yeah, mm hmm. What do you say, Kurt? Yeah, won't wo again. If it's by law, if it's by status, if it's by your doing, you're toast. Sorry, but that's not the way God goes, Deidre. Oh, yeah. The person who was not properly prepared for the event binds him hand and foot and casts him out into the outer darkness and says, You believe me, you're not going to see. Which is where? Hell. Right. Exactly. Many are called, but few are chosen. I'm sure you could Yeah. Um, I mean, I think. Well, and, and I'm kind of skirting around the answer to the question by talking about the fact that Christianity is, in fact, a terribly simple religion. 
Why? Because it's totally dependent on God's acts for humans. Where we run into trouble is we either want to turn God into a legalist, right? In other words, I have to do something, even if the something is purely psychological, to make God happy with me, right? Um, or we're self-righteous in the sense that we think, and I mean, in our heart of hearts, we know very well that we're never going to get there on our own. Um, or you do actually have people who think that they have gotten there on their own, and not only that, that can provide merits for you. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know where you come up with this. It's certainly not in the Bible. Um, so the problem is the calling of Christ is to be like Mary. May it be unto me, even as you have said. But you see, it is against the inclination of fallen humans to let God be God. Again, we're like the cat that brings the dead mouse to the door of your house and says, don't you want this nice, half-chewed-up dead mouse? Yeah, yeah. We do it for you. Right? Isn't that USPS? Yeah, there you go. Uh, we deliver for you. Um, but you see, God doesn't want our delivery. He wants to give us himself. And we struggle with this. This is why you end up with few. Because it's always a battle over you know, can I depend on God to be who he says he is? And, of course, the short answer to that question is, yes, yes absolutely. Who in the world is less likely to be a liar than God? Yeah. I mean, God's not a liar. If God's a liar, all right. So we're all just going to get another donut, go home. If God's a liar, right, the Bible continually testifies that God is no liar and that you are. How do you judge God to be a liar? You are one. That doesn't work out very well, right? Okay, anyway. Uh, anything further there? All right, let's move on to the topic of justification by faith. So the Bible uses what we would call a courtroom term or a juridical term, a term of jurisprudence or something like that. It was used in courts of law in Greece uh, and in the Roman world generally for what the judge said to you if you were acquitted. Right? You were considered dikaiosune, and you were therefore a dikaios, a righteous person. So, one of my favorite justices, by the way, to justify means to acquit or count not guilty. When the Bible talks about uh, counting righteous or justifying, this is the term. So you can be as guilty as sin, if you excuse the pun, and you can get off in a court of law by some kind of uh, technicality or uh, your HIPAA rights, no, wrong rights, sorry, Miranda rights, <laughs> got to keep them all straight, your Miranda rights weren't read to you or whatever, right? So, or, or there was unlawful search and seizure, you know, they stole the information off your Facebook, oh wait, they're doing that, aren't they? Never mind, okay, so, but... Uh, <laughs> So, what, what do we mean? So, this is the word that Paul uses here in Romans 3.28, for we hold that one is justified, that is, counted not guilty by God, that is, acquitted of all sins, and held to be righteous by faith. And again, faith isn't your work. Um, I'm, I'm, I used to be a baseball fan. There's a long... Uh, it, when, when Major League Baseball couldn't correctly spell its own acronym, I decided to stop watching. I'll just let you consider that for a minute. Um, hmm? Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, where was I? Oh, 
So Nolan Ryan, what does he throw? Seven no-hitters, right? Alan Ashby caught, I think, four of them or three of them. I forget which. And basically, Ashby said, all I did was put up my glove, right? He, he, you know, he, and, and, and of course, he, he hit it every time. Um, so this is what faith is. It's the catcher's mitt. The catcher does not uh, create the no-hitter. He receives it. And then, in fact, this is one of the, pun, not puns, but other words we have for a catcher. We call him a receiver. And in fact, a catcher is exceptionally good at it. We certainly would call a receiver. Um, so, but this is what faith is. Faith is this. You can't catch it unless you are. Oh, yeah. Well, sure. Right. You've got to put your mid up, right? But you're not striking out the batter. That's the pitcher's job. That's God. You're just receiving what he sends. And, of course, Alan Ashby is famous because he did catch so many of Nolan Ryan's no-hitters. I know somebody on Facebook is going to correct me about the number of no-hitters he caught. But anyway, I don't know what it is exactly. I think it's three. Um, so that's, that's what faith is. Faith is the receiving hand. And, of course, what's interesting is, elsewhere in the Bible... Faith itself is a gift of God so that no one can boast. The point being that faith is the opposite of works, right? So apart from works of the law. So faith is not some kind of minor work. Faith is merely reception. Ah, dear Lord. Give me all your gifts. Have I deserved them? No. Have you promised them to me? Absolutely. And I will be totally confident of that. That's faith. All a blessing, all a gift. Now you can presume on that to your heart's content. Lutheranism, by the way, is susceptible to liars and the self-righteous and so on. Um, but you're welcome to it. I'm going to continue to tell you the gospel even if you abuse it. Because the abuse is on your head, not mine. All right, let me just pause there. Questions about what justification by faith is. This is, of course, the center of the Reformation. It is the central insight of Dr. Martin Luther, uh, which he comes upon kind of by fits and starts in the 15 teens. Um, and that... That fact motivates him throughout the Reformation to see to it that Christ is preached as Savior always. Wes? Yeah, and, and so, yeah, this is just such a central understanding because in Luther's town, people would claim that you could even make contributions and you would be... Uh, sure. You, you, you know, if you, if you, you, you know, gave enough to the church... Or Sure. Or you, or you, you denied yourself if you went out. And, uh, yeah, the famous uh, ditty. Of course, advertising is not new. There were ad men in the 16th century, and they they had a jingle: "When in the when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs." Isn't that lovely? Friar yep, that is that is Friar Tetzel. Who? This is interesting, by the way, Tetzel who causes Luther to get all knotted up about, about the uh, indulgence trade and starts the Reformation, dies forgotten by his own team. Except Luther went to visit him on his deathbed. Uh, it wasn't indulgences. <laughs> it was the mercy of Christ, right? Uh, so... Uh, the, the Roman Church just simply dropped him like a hot iron, and because he had caused all this ruckus that, that gets Luther going, and the rest, as they say, is history. But Luther goes to his deathbed. I think it's in the early 1520s, and he's totally forgotten by Rome. So, all right.
questions about justification by faith before we move on to the third article of the Creed. All right, so the third article of the Creed. So we've had the first article, which is the Father. We've had the second article, which is the Son. We've got the third article, which is the work, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, of course, the Apostles' Creed, uh, uh, the third article goes this way. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So, again, we have the children's explanation, which Luther provides in the small catechism. What does this mean? And this sentence separates Lutheran Christianity from everybody else. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So I'll comment a little bit on the uniqueness of those words. And then he goes on to say, in the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. What word group, again, do you see there? Just we did in the explanation of the second article. I am the first article. Yeah, I mean my mind, right? Very personal. All my sins, right? It's all well and good to say they forgive David's sins, that God, that God forgives David's sins. Doesn't do me any good whatever that David is forgiven. I have to be the one forgiven, right? So it is very personal. Now, of course, we do, we, we, we do this together. That's the church's life. But still, um, you can't believe for another and another can't believe for you. Just that simple, all right? What's unique here in that first sentence is the claim that 100% of your salvation is creditable to the mercy of God. We, we're, not, we're not ivory snow believers that say it's 99 and 44 one hundredths percent God and the rest is mine. I don't get started. I don't complete. Uh, it's his totally giftedness, absolutely. Now, don't misunderstand. Um, we may, the best way to describe it, we may kind of psychologize about our own coming to faith. This happened, that happened, I recognized this, you know, I had this experience and so on. Um, but theologically, as we look back, we always have to say, God did this. And of course, that's why we're so certain about it. So it's not... You know, people, when, when, you know, someone says, do you know you're going to heaven? You go, of course I know I'm going to heaven. And they look at you and go, well, aren't you self-righteous? Well, no. I believe in the God who fulfills his promises. He, he's going to, he has done this for me. This is why I can be absolutely certain, right? If it is in any way, shape, or form dependent on good old moi, I'm always going to be uncertain. Um, official Roman Catholic teaching is that, for example, is that you should be uncertain. It's what the Lutherans call in our literature the monstrum incertitudinis, the monster of uncertainty. And what it does is it attributes to us some portion of the gracious work of Christ. By attribute, I don't mean give, but that we have done something to deserve. Yeah, Joanna. Okay, so my dad is an Orthodox Jewish man. We were, we were raised Episcopalian. Yeah, right. Things happened. He decided I'm going to go to a church that has some doctrine. Right, right. He's an Orthodox Jew. And he was dying bed. He didn't know he was going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, but that's that's exactly what grace is, right? So am I going to get to heaven because I'm a Lutheran pastor? No, I'm more likely to go to hell, quite frankly. Um, that's the truth. Um, if it's up to me, I'm toast. It's not up to me. Yeah. Sure, sure, great. So let's let's take the example of a small child. Um, I don't know, something untoward happens. The child wails, is afraid, uh, perhaps afraid of punishment. Who knows? And the father comes and scoops the child up and says, "Nothing has changed. You are still my child, my son, my daughter, my beloved. How can I help?" Oh. Okay, right? So uh, we always run into trouble where we turn back in on ourselves. How do I feel? And it's hard, especially in our culture, where we have deified our feelings, right? Whatever I feel has to be right. And, of course, God comes along and condemns your bloody feelings. Um because how you feel doesn't change how he thinks about you and what he has done for you. And again, what does the son who, who comes back and says, Dad, I'll be a slave in your household, stinks like the hogs. What does he feel? He feels like he's absolutely unworthy to be a son. What does the father say? You are my son. Bring your fear bring your uncertainty, bring your filth, and I will take care of it. Yeah. Right? And we, we all struggle with this, even as parents, right? Occasionally our kids do something where we just prefer to kick their posteriors. But again, that may not be good parenting because our Heavenly Father is the sign of good parenting. You want to be a good parent? Follow your Heavenly Father. Well, okay, so um, so when, when your friend calls you for Thanksgiving dinner, right, um, calls you on Monday, we're having Thanksgiving dinner, will you join us? You will say what words? You are absolutely right. What can I bring? Right, when God calls and says, I have this banquet for you, you say, what can I, wait a minute, how's that going to work, right? Oh, look, God, I have this wonderful pink Cadillac that you'd really like, right? I mean, this is absurd, right? He says, aren't the cattle on a thousand hills mine, says the Lord? You're bringing me one? I own them all. So our idea that we can offer God something is risible. It's stupid. It's funny. Um, because, it, you know, it would be like buying Christmas gifts for Bill Gates, No, do I, that, 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 whatever. Well, right. But so, uh, uh, like when my children were little, they bought me things that I, um, well, I didn't want. <laughs> what did I do when I opened that gift? <gasps> How wonderful. I've always wanted one of these pink widgets. Um, so, <laughs> so, so but, but this is the love of a father to a child. And, of course, this is one of the symbols of our Father's love for us in the Bible. What does Jesus say? You should become like a little child. And he's got the kid on his lap and is hugging him. I want to be that child. I want to come with nothing. I have these friends, they're members here, who uh, cook and bake just sublime things, Right? And so when it's time to go to their house for dinner, I, I can't even say the words, what can I bring? Because it's always going to look second rate in comparison to what they can make. And I, again, we have, we have friends, members here, who 
I, I can't afford the wine they serve us. I can't bring a bottle. That's ridiculous. I've got, it's, you know, but they, they generously give these things to us and we enjoy them. So this is the way of friendship. And this is the way of God. God's our friend. He wants to have a banquet with you. And you don't need to bring anything but your hunger. Ah. Right, right. And, I mean, who's the bridegroom in the parable? It's Christ. Christ sets the table for us and invites us. And the funny thing is that many people will say to the invitation, what again, or do I have to, or i got better things to do, and wait, my kid's playing baseball, and are you not listening? And I, I think I've used the illustration with you before. Um, again, on Christmas Day, say to your children or grandchildren, when it's time to open the gifts, um, it's time to open the gifts. Now, if you don't do so immediately, I'm going to punish you very severely. What will they say to you when you say those words to them? Are you out of your mind? Why? Because it's about the gifts. No one has to be made to open a gift. It's a joy. Oh, you're inviting me to start passing out the gifts? Let me get at it. Hooray, right? So, But here we are going, oh, do I go to go? It's like the child saying, oh, do I have to open my gifts? Have you ever heard a child say that? Right? But here we are, we're the children of God going, eh, do I have to? No, you don't have to. But you don't understand what's under the tree if I have to make you. That's the deal, right? Okay. All right, what else? How do we get on to all that? You're at peace. I feel, I feel like it's in the office. And it's the opening of the Oh, yeah. It's right. at the very right. beginning of the sermon. Well, what, it, what it's doing is dragging you back by the collar to the baptismal font, right? Because that's where forgiveness comes from. That's why the service begins in the same words intoned over you at your baptism. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then we give absolution. Right, so those things are related. But I, I appreciate your point very much, David. And, and as I say, I suppose an 18-year-old, I had kind of that same experience where you go, oh, this is a lot bigger than I thought, right? I'm an idiot kid. Um, and I was attracted by legalistic Christianity, right? I, I saw the great works of others and thought, I want to do that. And won't God be happy with me if I can, right? And eventually I went, holy crap, this is about guilt. I'm being guilted to death. And just about that time, Martin Luther shows up in my life. I, I don't mean literally, but I read his Galatians commentary. And that changed everything. Because what does he emphasize? What God is doing not what I am doing. And that's all. That's the difference between heaven and hell. Life and death. Peace and despair. Right. 
Thank you. That's that's very appropriate. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. So let's talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. He is a person. So he's the third person of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so you hear already of the Spirit's work in Genesis 1 verse 2. The earth was out without form and void, which is actually one of my favorite Hebrew figures of speech. Tohu vabohu, it even sounds muddled up. Um, and in fact, I think in some corners of the world, the phrase tohu vabohu means confused. Uh, you all, uh, especially among scholars, they'll, they'll say that. And darkness was over the face of the deep, excuse me, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So you get the Spirit of God mentioned already in verse 2 of the Bible. Um, the Holy Spirit as I said, is the third person of the Holy Trinity, important to say, person of the Holy Trinity. Um, for example, you have, you have the um, stewardship event <laughs> of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember what happens to them? The other struck dead. I've never tried that in a stewardship program. Um, anyway, uh, so um, what they were doing is they were giving the proceeds from the sale of property to the church. And they made the claim that they gave it all. And of course, God knew better and alerted Peter. And of course, Peter then alerts both Ananias and Sapphira and they die. But the text here is instructive. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? So it wasn't a question of did they hand over the whole amount, but what did they say they handed over? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So notice how he's already said that Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Who is he? He's God. You lied to God by lying to the Holy Spirit. So, um, and of course, you know, I don't know. Can you lie to your dog? But does he know or she? I mean, I don't know. Like, like say, I'm bringing you filet mignon for dinner tonight, my dear. And then you give the dog food. Can you lie to your dog? I don't know. I don't think so. Can you lie to this table? No. Can I lie to you? Yes, I can. Doctors get lied to all the time, don't they? Yeah. Um, I probably lie to them too. Um, so, so, <laughs> um, so you can lie to a person. So if you lie to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to a person, right? So it's important for us to say that the, the third person of the Trinity is a person. Uh, here again in Acts, while Peter was pondering the vision, this is the vision of the, uh, the uh, unclean and unclean animals, the Spirit said to him, so you get a specific word from the Spirit, behold, three men are looking for you. And of course, this is Cornelius' buddies who have come to take uh, uh, Peter back to visit with Cornelius the centurion. Um, you have, again, a very, very clear text, especially to the Greek reader, but hopefully this will be clear to you in English, uh, of Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, is that singular or plural? Singular. Of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit precisely the same construction in every case. So what Greek is showing you is that Father, Son, and Spirit are all equally God and divine and persons, right? Unfortunately, with English, we're, we're sloppy and so on, and we don't notice these things. And I just want to leave you with this thought. It isn't like Star Wars. The Holy Spirit is not the force. He's not, it's not a power, but 
it's not a power, right, I'm saying this wrong intentionally, it's not a power that enables you to do things you couldn't do before. He is a person who intrudes in your life with the power of the Word of God. He, like the Father and like the Son, is also the giving God. All right? So it, it, and it, what's interesting, of course, is Alec Guinness, um, who was apparently a kind of um, Orthodox Roman Catholic, was deeply chagrined about having played the part of Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, because he thought that the movies tended toward a cultic view of, like a spiritistic view of life. And he thought that was really unfortunate. Uh, and uh, so... That's an interesting... He's a smart guy. Uh, it's no longer with us, of course. Um, faded away just like Obi-Wan. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, that's where we'll leave... Oh, wait. So, the punchline is, not force, it's God. God himself is with you. All right. Next week, we'll take up with the work of the Holy Spirit... How many of you are, are planning to be here? Well, let's put it the other way. How many of you are planning not to be here because of the Thanksgiving break? All right, we'll meet anyway. Yeah? Um, so you can watch it online if you want, Ron. Yeah, sure. Because uh, I don't want to... We're probably a little bit behind, not terribly. We start to catch up after a while. Um, so any questions before we close with prayer? Hearing none, let us pray. Dearest Lord Jesus Christ, you have seen to our salvation with your suffering, death, and resurrection, and you have enabled us to receive it by sending your good spirit to us uh, that we might have confidence and faith in all that you have done. Help us to live in that peace that you want us to have, that peace that surpasses all human understanding, that peace that will guard our hearts and minds in you alone. Uh, bless our study together. Uh, may we meditate upon your gifts and thus be strengthened in our faith and enabled to share what we ourselves believe by your giftedness so that others might likewise have that same peace which you have granted to us. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, my dears, have a great Thanksgiving. Service is at 9 o'clock on Thanksgiving Day. I'll be here. Yes. Um, lovely, but you know the song says it never rains in California, but man, it pours. So what was it? All day Wednesday it rained, and then we went out on John Wayne's yacht for dinner, and it pelted. So it was a rather uneventful little yacht trip. Yeah, yeah. Exa that's exactly what I thought too. <laughs> Right, right, exactly, exactly. All right. Always a pleasure. It's fun to give away what's God's, right? It doesn't cost me anything. Good morning. Mark. Good morning, Carolyn. Oops. Pardon, excuse me.